Headliner Radio, the creative voice. Good morning from Los Angeles, California, and welcome to Headliner Live. Uh, my name is Will Hawkins, and today we're with Cat Popper, and this has been sponsored by Digigram, and we're powered by the Digigram Akoya X Link Talk and their Baby, Sa- baby Face software. Uh, our guest today epitomizes rock and roll badass and personifies all that it is to be a trusted, reliable, and sought out after session player who's elevated projects from Jack White, Jesse Mallon, Grace Potter, Mike Doty, Ryan Adams, and the Cardinals. And over the last couple of years, she's been playing out with Nora Jones and Sasha Dobson in Puss in Boots. And she's also got some amazing solo material that's been put, coming out as well. And uh, an old friend and someone who I admire very much, Cap Hopper, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. So good to see you. Nice to see you too. When did you, were you always a songwriter or was it something that just recently? So what inspired these groups of songs that, that you've been recording? Um, you know, I didn't really start writing songs. I just felt like I never really had like the audacity to write songs. And um, when I started playing with Puss in Boots, Nora um, Jones said to me and Sasha Dobson, like, hey, if you guys you know, why don't we put some originals on these records? And I thought, okay. Uh, And I just kept telling them, I don't write. I can't write. I can't do this. And they said, okay, so we'll see you, you know, Friday with the song, um, which is how that band works. Uh, So I wrote some songs and I thought, I'm, these are, these are pretty good. Um, And then like, you know, fixing them, it took me like a year per song. And um So then when this song sort of started to fall into place, um, this song, uh, my, the first song uh, that I released, maybe it's all right. It took me about five months. And I was like, that's a record for me. (laughs) Holy cow. (laughs) And, um, you know, lyrics are really important to me. Um, So I spend a lot of, like, I don't want any filler, no baby, this baby, that I wish I could, but I just, I'm just not that guy. I'm like, I can't pull off baby you know um you know no cap like i can't pull that stuff off like um anyway I, so i i guess i just you know i thought i'm gonna learn how to do it on garage band and i did this song on garage band and i sent it to jesse mallon and, and he uh who and he he has a record label with don delego and he's like let's put this out on velvet elk and my first thing was why like why would you we do this what do I have to do? <laughs> like, what's, what's, what's the catch? <laughs> and he said, well, why not? And I was like, man, that's a, that's a good response. So, you know, now it's out and I'm like, Oh, I want to do it better. So then I, I right. learned how to use logic and I recorded a second song, this, uh, a cover of Para Ubu's breath. And it sounds so much better. So now I want to go back and fix some of the stuff on like remix. Maybe it's all right. But, um, I, I didn't know that I was a guy who could like record at home. I didn't know that I could set up a, a microphone and like, you know, I use this microphone. I sing into it. I play upright bass. I play, you know, guitar. And it's like, nobody cares. I didn't know. I don't know what any of the knobs do. I just turn them, you know, and I, and then people are telling me, yeah, dude, nobody really does. Um, that sounds good. <laughs> well, isn't it all just about the song and that organic passion that you bring to it, you know, isn't it the honesty? Yeah. I mean, it's it's the honesty that you bring to those songs. Um, With working with songwriters like Grace Potter and Ryan Mm -hmm. and Nora, any of those influences come, those experiences playing with them influence your songwriting? Um, I didn't, you know, I didn't, uh, I didn't get to see, I guess the only songs that I saw really form from nascency were Ryan's songs. Um, you know, he would come, we'd be called into the studio, Ryan Adams at, at like 4 PM and he would show up at 10 PM with a sandwich and sit down with a blank piece of paper and start writing a song. And then we'd all be asleep. And at 2 AM he'd say, all right, let's record. And then we would play the song, whatever, just guess, guessing what the chords were going to be. Um, and then that would be the take. Uh, so we, we might not have ended it or gotten any of the chords right. And uh, it was pretty, pretty wild to watch somebody 
write that fast. So I think I always compared myself to that, you know? Right. Um, but then I would like, he would like step out or something for a little while and I would go and fix like some of the bass notes that were really egregious. Um, so I, I do like the idea of things being loose, like that really influenced me on those records. I feel like the, like the hiss and the air and people knocking things over is like a, it's like a, another band member. Yeah. It's um, those Cardinals records are almost like seventies rock and roll. Record. It's true. And I remember, you know, I was in the car once listening to a radio station. I was like, oh, the station went away and I turned it up and it was like the hardest part or something. It's like, oh, you can't play stuff on the radios too. It's like not, it's not like stuff that you can, you know, you hear. Uh, it's it's yeah. just so, it's so quiet, mixed so low. Um, I love that. I love lo-fi stuff. But uh, yeah, and I guess, um, you know, Jack White, we made... Um, that one record and there were no lyrics to anything. So I didn't even know we had made a, a record um, to like literally a year later. Someone's like, did you hear the record? And I said, what record? And they're like the record that you made. I was like, with who? I didn't know. Um, I didn't know it had been a record. So I think I have my own. I think that's the problem is that I have my own writing style and because it's mine and I haven't seen it before, I assumed it was wrong. You know, there, there really is no one way to do it. And I think, shows like this we do get to talk a little bit about everyone's process and mm -hmm. no one's doing anything for the first time and i think what's great about it is that you start hearing someone who you admire who writes songs and someone out there is going wow i do that too and i didn't think i was doing it right i remember years ago i was working at at a recording studio in new york and we stumbled across a marvin gay uh two-inch master from from Loverman, which didn't even get released. And when we were listening back to his vocals, it was him just trying stuff out for the most part. It was just a, it was him just comping and just flow of consciousness and over a set of chords that he, he had already recorded that were set. And then he's just trying to find his way through it. And some of those songs ended up becoming full tracks on the next album. And I remember at the time I was probably 22 or 23 and that's how I was writing songs because I didn't know any better. Mm. And, it, and being able, and I remember saying to the, the engineer who I was working for, I'm like, I don't get, what is he doing? These songs aren't done. He goes, right. He goes, we're, we're actually witnessing years later him, his process of writing songs, which is getting in the studio, finding a melody, then coming back and writing the lyrics. <clears throat> and his process is, Unlike Ryan's, where he he can sit down and write a whole song in 20 minutes, so prolific that he is. But there is no wrong way. At the end of the day, the our listeners are are trying to f connect with us in the way that we we express ourselves and going through the same joys or heartbreaks, whatever it is. And it, and that's what connects us with our listeners is a, a commonality of experience. And I think the the more honest you can be, like the more raw you can be about, it, the more people you're gonna you're gonna touch. But that's really the hard part. Is like like you were saying the oh babies, like anyone can write the oh babies, but to replace that with something that's actually personal, and to be okay with sharing that, opening up your diary, mm. and sharing those experiences with the world, it's hard. So you know, kind of cro finally cross the line where you don't think about it anymore. Well, but and I, just to be clear. Uh, oh baby is some people's experience and process like no disrespect sure. I just no, can't no, I can't I pull it off and I do feel like I spend a lot of time like what is something that's going on in my life and how can I couch this in metaphor um, so I don't only have to talk about it if I want to <laughs> you, no, know I mean? <laughs> you know I was I went out for a run right before we spoke and I was I was listening to some of those old recordings that you did with the nocturnals and the cardinals mm -hmm. And I, as I was walking in the house, I had some of the Cardinal stuff on and I just wrote, okay, on my phone, which has a thousand different song ideas, just song ideas, just another day without you. And that's okay. And that came mm. from just listening from something that you guys played 15 years ago. And for me, that's sometimes that's how my songs start is just, it's there. And some of these songs are inspired by going to a, a gallery or watching a movie or hearing a, like it's. All of a sudden, I'll just it'll touch upon some story that I haven't told yet, and mm -hmm. I've seen it in a way I've, I've experienced somebody else trying to do it, and I'm all of a sudden it opens up a door for me. When yeah, it's it's I love that I I I didn't realize that 
you know what you said earlier and I interrupted you, but and I'm, I'm going to let you finish. But what I was going to say is earlier when you were talking about comparing like, um, you know, other people's like finished product to your own middle, right. like to your middle of the process. And I've been doing that all my life with everything. So I love your, that reference to Marvin Gaye. Like it's, it was um, hard because at the time we, I was making records with Diana Krall, uh, Michael Brecker, Robin Ford, George Benson, Dr. John, all like, so here I was in my twenties and you got somebody who's been doing this for 20, 25 years and they've nailed it. They know exactly how to express themselves. And I'm barely, a, 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 you know, I'm still figuring it out. And it really, uh, it, it was overwhelming at times. And it's, and there was a period where I stopped writing because I was trying to live up to these standards that they had set after being professional for so long. Mm -hmm. And here I am a baby <clears throat> and I was so intimidated and it and it took me some time to come back to it and and friends to kind of be supportive and be like, come on, man, what the hell do you expect? It's George Benson. You know, it's just like, you know, how how do you expect to compare yourself to things like that? Mm -hmm. When you first came to New York, you, you were playing more jazz, right? I came to New York, uh, you know, I uh, upright, started playing upright bass when I was about nine. And I went to the North Carolina School of the Arts and studied classical music. And I was like, I, ne I hate this. I do not want to like spend uh 10 hours a day in a practice room learning excerpts to be in an orchestra like I, I this is not me yeah. so i um came to new york um i studied jazz in manhattan school and i would go to i went down to the bag it in and i sat it on the bluegrass sessions and i went to the contra dances and i learned irish music and i went to the limelight and saw like dave vanian's solo project i mean i um i new york i knew i knew this is where i needed to be so how did, were you playing in jazz bands at the time? Like, how did you transition into like playing those in these rock and roll bands that you're <laughs> now more well known for? It was, um, well, you know, at Manhattan school, I was there at a time where there was a, it was a, it was a boys club, you know, being a, a jazz upright, female jazz upright bass player in New York. And, um, I got called into like the head of the guy's office. He's like, you know, your jazz playing is suffering. We, we heard a rumor that you're like hanging out at Irish clubs and blue. And I was like, you, what, you heard a, a what, you know what I mean? I couldn't believe this. Um, so I kept doing what I was doing. And I think, you know, somebody came to hear me. There was a jazz club uh, called Augie's and I played there twice a week. Um, still open. It's called smoke now. And um I think somebody came in and heard me, uh, Phil Sherman. And it was like, it was like right at the end of the time when you could like go in Mercury Lounge and like every like label dude was there waiting to give someone a half a million dollar contract. They were yeah. like wearing ball caps and tennis shoes and they were just handing out, you know, it was like right at the end of that scene. Yeah. So um, I just started playing upright bass with this, you know, this band. And then um, it kind of, just blossomed from there, to be honest. But you know, this is stuff that I, like, I, I've, I've, ha I have every damned record in my. I listen to the Police. Like that's what I listened to growing up. You know, yeah. a lot of that, a lot of that stuff. So it, for me, it was just like, how do you play this stuff? So I didn't start playing electric bass till I was like twenty nine or thirty. Well, and who were you playing with then, when you started playing um, electric bass? Let's see. Uh. God. Well, one of, the, one of the first sessions I did was uh, this guy, JC Hopkins. He has like a big band and he did a session with uh, Levon Helm and Garth Hudson. And he's like, can you play some electric on it? And I was like, yeah, pull it out. And I listened to like some Beatles and played along with it, you know, and that's sort of how I learned to play electric bass. And um, I didn't even know who the band was. And I was like, D you guys, can we talk about the white album? Can we talk? about the band like this pink like northern light southern cross and people are like yeah that's you know it's good stuff where you been um was <laughs> in other places so i think yeah. it started it started there <laughs> Leave on and how did you find yourself playing in the cardinals um well i started touring with a band called hem which oh, uh right yeah, exactly. Everybody's like, oh, yeah, him. I remember him. Um, you know, it was like a sort of indie darling that was signed to DreamWorks. Um, yeah. And we did a little bit of touring. And I ended up doing something with 
I think James Eha recommended me to Ryan. Um, and when he called, I was like, how, that's, how did this happen? You know what I mean? Um, and that's sort of where like my larger touring, because in my 20s, I had a part-time job. I would take my upright bass to the World Trade Center, you know, World Financial Center across the street. And I'd set it in the corner and I'd do my thing and I'd go play gigs afterwards till I was in my late 20s. What was your part-time job in your 20s? I was like, uh, I tempt, I worked for if like the CFO and the CTO um, of Merrill Lynch. Like I, I was like their, the one that they would call, their secretaries would yeah. call to come. I didn't know what I was doing. Like this was a different time. It was like $25 yeah. an hour. Just don't knock over the computer. Every time they'd ask me to make a memo, I'd have to Google like how to make a memo. You know, you can't even get a gig like that with a college degree now. No, you can't. And I did some temping around that time too on, on wall street. And it was, <laughs> and I'll say this, I went into it kind of with a chip on my shoulder. I'm like, I don't, I don't connect to anyone. I'm not going to connect mm-hmm. to anyone there. But what I found, like, just like any other industry, there was a bunch, there was a kid who was a DJ and he was just like doing his job just to be able to be a DJ. There's a lot of people just doing their job just so they could do other things. And I ended up making a lot of friends there in ways that I didn't oh, anticipate. Wow. Yeah, it was incredible. Um, I recently watched one of the videos I watched of you was with Jesse and, uh, it was at Bowery ballroom a couple of years ago with, with Ryan. Um, and I've always found you to be like open, playful, talented, but there was the video I watched was Ryan had just come up on stage and he was just about to play and you leaned over and you detuned one of his strings. <laughs> yeah, sounds right. And you were laughing hysterically and he looked like <laughs> <laughs> sounds right. <laughs> I, am the- a, I, I am an upstart. That's for sure. When you were touring with him, was that the kind of relationship that the two of you had? Or is this what he came to, ex- to expect of you and just be frustrated? And <laughs> we dished it out um, equally, you know, I mean, and you know, he, he was a nightmare um sometimes and then sometimes it's like the most fun that I've ever had um and you know it was definitely like when I left the band I was like what what a ride that was you know but we were I mean I you know I've been sober 14 years now this month and like I was not sober thank you I was not sober then and um so it was just all like a like frenzied whirlwind at the time but yeah I mean it was constant for sure what are some of your more favorable memories of of being in that situation with the cardinals how many years were you guys together a couple albums i thought you were gonna say a couple hours and i was gonna say yes yes um because the cardinals disbanded you know it was like always like you guys are all fired and then like please come back so um I guess it started in like, I'm so bad, like 2004, 2005. Yeah. And then I think I left during 2007. Um, but uh, more favorable. Or just a good, like good memories of being with the band. I mean, there's so many. It was yeah. just, you know, it was God just stirring up trouble and you know uh it's funny i always remember this time i was on the bus and um i would sit up front with the driver and i was listening to um silver and gold the neil young record yeah. and you know that uh own uh owners without things sharpshooters without wings i can't remember the name of the song but i was listening to it and ryan just came up he said what are you listening to and i gave him the headphones and he kind of closed his eyes and then right then it was when the part where neil goes my software is not compatible with you and he was like wow and i was like i know but just rewind it like because <laughs> uh but it was just so, like the sun was setting um and you know we had so much fun on the bus writing songs and like blasting um pig destroyer at like four a- and jesse mallon was like yes I was there, I remember, because I was trying to sleep and you guys were smoking on the bus, cigarettes. And today is my, I think, 12 years without a cigarette, too. So, um, yeah, I actually don't drink water or eat food anymore. So I just want to I'll let you know when those anniversaries are. But, um, yeah, it's just blasting metal 
like I'd never heard a Black Sabbath record that way until you've heard it just wasted at 4 a.m. as you know, as high as the volume will go. Um, and just on stage, him he'd start to play a song, you know, we're playing for however many thousands of people, and he's playing a song. And I looked at Brad Pemberton, the drummer, and he goes, mm. So we just played a song we didn't know. And I was like, yeah. this is what I'm here for. Right. Like, I'll do anything. Like, let's, yeah, man. Like, make me make people are always like, you know, hey, this this artist doesn't, you know, he doesn't follow the set list. I'm like, yeah, imagine playing a song you've never heard. I love that stuff. One of the things he he started doing very well before he stopped touring was he took a page out of like the Grateful Dead kind of mm. school. And he started doing like performance pieces of certain songs that he would extend 12, 15 minutes, mm -hmm. take them somewhere else and then come back. And he's become a much better like lead guitar player over the last six or seven years as well. I, I think he's one of the best performers that are out there. And I, I hope he finds his way back. I, however, he, I, however he ends up doing it. I hope, I hope he does what's necessary to find his way back. Yeah, you know, people came for me when he got into hot water and people are like, what do you know what happened? It's nobody, it's nobody's business. Like if feminism, if we're going by feminism rules, it's nobody's business, like what happened to me or what didn't happen to me. And um, you know, I've uh it's private. And yeah. you know, I uh my opinion, opinions are poison um in my mind, especially right now. So uh, you know, he, uh, he's somebody that I'll probably always care about. And, uh, yeah, you know, it sounds like he's going through a rough thing and, um, you know, every so often we talk and sometimes it's like, never call me again. And then sometimes it's like, Hey, what's up? You know, can you talk? So, right. uh, listen, as somebody who's been sober 14 years, uh, I don't slap people's hands away when they, when they reach out. Cause Lord knows I did some crazy stuff. I'm not excusing his behavior. I'm talking about right. me. I understand. Um, so, you know, I don't really talk about this stuff much. I don't talk about this stuff ever. Um, but you know, if anybody, you know, uh, I'm an ally, I'm a woman, I have to deal with some crazy wild stuff. And, uh, I don't know if, you know, if people are mad at me, they cannot buy the music that nobody's buying anyway. I don't, I don't think that would be end of the case to, to give it back. <laughs> you know? I mean, that's the thing. It's like people, people are charged up, you know, and I get it. I'm afraid too. people yeah. are so charged up and angry. And I know that, uh, you know, there's collateral damage when there's change made. And like, just by saying what I'm just said, you know, just said, I could be collateral damage for not saying the thing that I, you know, that that wounded people need to hear and right. i just i got to do the best i can and for someone who's known you as long as i have i know that you've got a big beautiful heart you know you're not going to find anyone who's more generous than you how was your how was that experience working with grace potter and nocturnals different than it was working with ryan well you know grace uh first of all they all knew each other so i felt like i stepped into this world of um uh I was really uncomfortable at first and Grace is like a sister. I mean, she, you know, she, and it was the first time that I was like, well, she's wearing all these, I look now at these pictures. I'm like, Oh my God, I'm not wearing any pants. But at the time it was like Grace's skirts were shorter. She was sexier. So I thought, well, maybe I can try this too. She would put makeup on me. There's like, she, I remember one time I stepped on glass um, right before a gig and she came up and like to my hotel room and I was like, <laughs> and she, you know, took the glass out of my foot. Like uh, she really, like she, she really, she's a special one and she took great care of all of us. And there's actually a story she mentioned it, but she it was really sick once at a gig and she was actually like pooping herself. And so, so they were like, you have to go to the hospital. She's like, no, I'm doing the gig. So she wore a diaper on stage wow. and i was like if you're wearing a diaper i'm wearing a diaper so in the pictures we're all like you know like and we're wearing like diapers yeah you heard it, it awesome. here right here on headliner that's, that's, <laughs> Grace. you heard it right here 
Oh uh, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. That's the thing about touring though. Like that's all you talk about. Cause what's different from today and yesterday is like uh, what you had for breakfast and did you poop? Yeah. Touring. I think you just came up with the title of your next record. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if, if, uh, if, if anybody a real knows. intimate affair from cat popper, <laughs> you can't put any ballads on that record though. You know, <laughs> and then you found yourself in a band with Nora Jones and Sasha Dobson. How did, how did that trio come about? Well, that's been going on since 2007. So oh, wow. that was like the timeline is really fractured or perfect, whatever you want to say. But um, they reached out to me on MySpace um, and said, and said, Hey, do you want to play drums in our band? And I just didn't see the message. Um, and then I, I think I was at, you know, the living room scene back then. It was like, it was a watering hole in the Serengeti. Yeah. You know, everybody was at the living room. So Nora was there. And, you know, like I saw the Avett brothers play there, four people. It was such a scene. And so I think I was at the living room and I, um, Nora and Sasha came up to me and they're like, did you get our message? And I said, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. And they were like, oh, thank God. We thought you thought we were stupid. And um, so we, you know, we did a gig at Shaney Race Truck Stop uh shane uh it's like um what was the name of that club the de brothers had a club national underground um and yeah we just got together and played they were trying to learn how to play guitar and um they said you need to play bass for now and then we you know i went and did grace potter and i did jack white and you know peter rowan and tony rice and I was going to play with Levon, so like uh, it's all these different things, but interspersed, we would do like some Puss in Boots stuff, like, you know, play a show with different names, like, uh, you know, because if you, you know, it's like the, the New York Times is going to show up and review Nora if it's like, right. so anyway, um, yeah, it was really, it's been really special. And then, you know, we would do a cluster of gigs and say, let's make a record. So that's how the the two records have come about over the years. Uh, I saw you guys at Pappy and Harriet's a couple of years ago yeah. in Joshua Tree, and um, it the the connection between the two, the three of you, is amazing. You know, yeah. it's so much and it's so much fun to watch y'all do that, and it must be amazing for Nora to be able to express herself that way because she's you know taken so seriously as a jazz artist, and then she can kind of have her playful side with y'all. And that's how she she is that playful person, like all the all the time you know and it was so interesting um like there's a song called it's not easy on the newer record sister we didn't get to tour and uh you know nora started to play this groove and sasha's like i'm gonna go to the kitchen and get a lemonade and then i just sat down at the drums and started playing and we had a gig that night um at you know pete's candy store not uh sunny's bar in red hook yeah and um then sasha came in she's like this is cool and she started playing and we banged out some lyrics and they said well you're going to play drums and i literally don't have a drum kit and have never played drums before and i said well i can't i don't know how to play drums and they and they just stared at me and then i said i guess i'm playing drums and so i played drums on the record you know yeah. like and that's the thing like i've spent so much of my life my first instinct is to say uh, i can't or i don't want to like no you know what i mean no is always and that band was the first band those women are amazing. Like it's, it's like this, why would you say what? It's not even like a discussion. It's like, well, the answer is not no, it's yes. So yeah. moving on. And what's next for, for that band with y'all? It's a, I mean, you know, what's next for anybody. Um, yeah. We were going to play jazz fest uh, and then, you know, poor new Orleans, like, Oh, my yeah. heart, my heart, my heart was heavy for them a month ago. Like, um, so, you know, we have this record uh, and we had a string of dates booked. Um, and now Nora, she's put out, what, like three records this year because she's just bored. So, like, she has a day job. Sasha has a day job. I have a day job, meaning, like, I have these other gigs that I do. So we have right. now we have to, like, find time when we're not doing our other gigs, you know, day job. Yeah. Um, so, uh We'll see, you know. Yeah, it's a whole lot of we'll see. I've canceled more shows in the last month. There's still venues here in Los Angeles that, you know, people want to play. Um, 
but I'm excited for next year. You know, it's like, <clears throat> I'm excited for maybe in the spring, we're a little bit further along and it's incredible to think that we've already like almost a solid two years that we've been dealing with this. It's, um, it's been, and who knows? And, and I know you relate cause you just made this amazing record oh, and, you. um, I admire, I was, I was talking to you about the, you made a video, um, out of like, like a photo montage video and I love it. Thank I love you. it. It's such a good idea. And I was, I really like looking at it It's and listening to it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, what, what can we look forward to as far as your solo project coming up? Um, well, I'm, you know, I'm doing an opening sh show for Jesse um, Mallon at the Stone Pony, wow. um, which is terrifying. Like, I, you know, like I'm, you know, it's like I'm a side man. I get hired. I sit in the back of the bus. I complain like and now I, I'm the guy like, what did I say? I'm joining the ranks of the oppressors. I'm the guy who's like, you know, you, you rehearsal. You just, you know, I know I texted you, but I didn't hear back. And yeah. Um, Clock you know, watcher. So yeah, exactly. Like, so I had to get a band together and like, I'm sorry, I can, I can pay you in like half rewound VHS copies of enemy mine and the saltine crackers and whatever. And um, like this cracker band, they're so good. And um, you know, we, we did a rehearsal, like a first rehearsal where I was a band leader and I was like, wow, we had a break. I was like, Oh my God, you guys need a break. <laughs> I'm sorry. Are we, is this cool? And then I, like I ended early. I was like, you know what? Rehearsing really sucks. Like, let's just go. But so I'm I'm writing. Um, I'm working with this drummer, Van Romain, who uh, he's just like a brilliant drummer. He's a studio and um, I'm recording at home. I did this song, Breath. It's getting some radio play, nice. um, which has been awesome. I did an interview with the guy, uh, David Thomas from Pear Ubu, who's like a infamous like uh interesting character and he was really complimentary um so yeah and I'm, I'm also learning how to use premiere pro um and i've been making little videos and i have uh, an interview project idea that we're developing here um yeah so a solo record um and my day job which you know broadway i'm playing on a broadway show it's supposed oh, cool. to open back up and what show is I, that it's called diana and again, like, who knows, like, who knows if that's going to be a thing, right. but you know, all after I'm listing all these things that I'm doing, I just want to give a shout out for people who are like, I can only do the bare minimum. Like, uh, you know, I can, I can sort of eat and like not really sleep. And, and I'm under the cover shivering, like shout out to those people. Cause, uh, you know, we are human beings. We're not human doings. Um, just saying like, I don't know why I am all these, I've having this creative process open up, but people who aren't like, I feel you and I hear you. And that would usually be me. So it's, I think you're right. And it's important to, uh, to really listen to not just your body, but listen mm -hmm. to your mind as to what you can and can't do. Mm -hmm. And my therapist is always like, look, when, when you're feeling like you can't go forward, take that break. It's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, take that exhale, take that break and come back when you're ready. Cause mm -hmm. when you're really, when you're pushing it and you're, you're at the seams, you're not going to be doing your best work and you're certainly not going to behave in your best way or treat people the best way that you can when you're stressed out or filled with anxiety. So as children of the seventies of you and I both are, it's like the voices in the head keep are like push forward, get it done pull your bootstraps up and get it, you know, is, but we have to pay attention to our minds and bodies and let, and, and take that break and do what we're ready to do when we're ready mm -hmm. to do it. So I, I think it's, it's terrific that you're making that call out because not enough people do that, especially in our industry. Cause there's a lot of like driving to the hoop hard and getting it done as opposed Every, to everybody's been at home for months looking on Instagram like who's doing what, who's done what I've not. And I went through yeah. this. I was like, I haven't done, I've yeah. wasted my life. Um, and that's okay. Like, this is what I wrote the song about. Maybe it's all right that I feel like a loser. 
maybe it's all right that I do not want it, that today I think I'm never going to play music again. Maybe that's fine. And um, those experiences. And if, if it took that in order to be able to write that song, if it took that shitty relationship to write that song and express that, to be able to connect with someone who's going through the same thing, that's, that's kind of our job that is part of our job is being able to make those connections, but also to send these dispatches out from this, from the ends of the earth back into society and be like, we're with you. You know, I went through Mm -hmm. the same thing. I know we've never spoke, but I'm going to send it through the airways for you to be able to understand that you're not the only one out there who's feeling this. And that's, I think that's the best of what we can do as songwriters. I, I remember watching this interview with Richard Pryor and he's like one of the first comedians that really opened up, about his failures about Mm -hmm. as you know on so many levels and the people in the audience weren't used to hearing someone like so raw Mm -hmm. with his emotions and again coming back like this is what our listeners and the people who are listening to music they're they're seeking answers themselves that they can't find and sometimes they can find it through the music that they listen to Mm -hmm. and the body of work that you've been able to be involved in over the last 20 years it's just like I've spent the last couple of days, I've listened to everything you've done. And this is part of my prop. And it's part of my process as being an interviewer is I've spent the last three or four days listening to everything recorded and as much as I could, I could get through and on YouTube, you know, it's just, and so much of yourself comes out in this music. And even mm-hmm. like that time with, with Ryan, with the like screwing with his guitar. I mean, it, these are the things about you as an artist that people get drawn to. You know, it's just, and I'm such a massive fan of everything that you've done. And I'm so excited to see you start this new chapter as a band leader and as a songwriter. Uh, It it can be scary at times, but you know, it's, you got both hands on the wheel and so far what you've done is beautiful. And I'm, I'm so proud of you and I'm just so I'm thrilled for you you. in this next, for this next chapter of yours. Um, and I, I think you're going to do awesome for the same reasons that we've all been connecting with you for 20 years as, as a bassist, we're going to connect with you as, as a songwriter as well. And I'm really excited to hear what you got to say. What a kind thing to say. Thank you. It's been so nice. We, we got on the phone the other day and we talked for like 40 minutes and I was like, what are we doing? We got to save some of this for, the, yeah, I know. for right. the view, for the interview. Well, it's, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for being a part of this. It's um I, I, I hope that these that these interviews we come across like we're a couple friends sitting around talking about their experiences, you know, sitting in a bar in corner in New York somewhere. And, and yeah, um, and again, like these interviews, it's too. It's like you know we're talking about like these. We're, like it's so hard to explain process to people and how dirty and smelly and uncomfortable process is. And it it how, yeah, it's just so. And I just think so many people are uncomfortable like right now. And I just appreciate that we can talk about, uh, I was saying to somebody the other day, like, like it must, I bet it's really uncomfortable when a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. Like it probably sucks just a little bit. Well, at the beginning (laughs) of anything, of course, like it, it's uncomfortable because it's a new experience and you, and you're unsure, you know, you, you can, you can be that caterpillar for so long, you know, and get so used to the experience of how even your predators even respond to you. And then all of a sudden you blossom into this butterfly and now you can fly. It's like, of course, you're going to run into some walls. That's, I mean, that's part of life and part of the experience of whether it being a new band leader or a new host to a show, mm-hmm. we're going to make mistakes, but it's, it's through those mistakes that we, we gain our knowledge and we get to be better at what we do, mm-hmm. but it's only through being fearless through those failures that we can power through and, and have that metamorphosis ourselves. Mm-hmm. Otherwise we're stagnant, you know, it's mm-hmm. just like, and and a, a life worth living is not a stagnant one. You know, we have to keep pushing ourselves. And I think what you're doing right now is amazing. And we here at Headline are huge fans and whatever we can do to help you. Um, and so I'm going to say thank you again. Uh, this is Will Hawkins, and this has been Headliner USA Live. Uh, I want to thank Digigram for being a sponsor for the last three shows. And uh, we hope that we'll continue to be able to work with you and Kat, thank you so much. Uh, where can everyone find you online? Um, uh, Instagram, Kat, C-A-T underscore popper. 
Um, and I, I have a website. I'm building a website. <laughs> I was like, always the guy was never going to have a website. Cat, catpopper.com. And um, just thank you and congratulations too on all oh, these you. things that you're doing. Uh, it's it's a wonderful new chapter, and yeah. um, I'm I'm excited for this as well. Well, everybody, thanks for coming, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Headliner Radio, supporting the creative community. 